have joined Clearwater Community Church. Take your Bibles, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 13, 1 Samuel 13. The title of our sermon in this series on rise and fall is Faith Over Fame, Faith Over Fame. This is in the sports calendar, probably my favorite time of year. I know football season has ended, and for many that's a, a time of mourning, uh, but the basketball tournament is going on right now, and I love men's college basketball. Ever since I can remember as a little child, I've, I've followed along with this. One of my earliest memories anymore, seared in my brain, is being grounded when I was seven years old and I was not allowed to watch the championship game. I don't cry too often. I cried myself to sleep that night. And I'm upset at my parents because that was the 1983 title game in which Houston and Phi Slamma Jamma lost to NC State and Jim Valvano, and I missed that game. I, that means nothing to most of you, but it was a monster college basketball game, and I missed it as a child. But I always have rooted for, uh, I don't know why, I don't know if they were on TV more as a child, but I've always had a rooting interest in uh, North Carolina, and um, UNC won yesterday, and somebody was reminding me they're in the Sweet 16, and they were congratulating me, and I said, we don't measure success in Sweet 16s at North Carolina, it's only in national championships, come on people, that's how its success is at North Carolina, but I have a couple of other rooting interests in this year's tournament, um, and for some reason the committee has pitted them against one another. And so Alabama will be playing uh, Grand Canyon this evening. Grand Canyon is where my daughter Emily is at school. And they won the other night on Thursday night. And so their first win ever within the tournament. And so they will be playing tonight to try to get to the Sweet 16. And so it's kind of fun to watch a Christian university have that level of success. But after the game the other night, they interviewed their star player and, and uh, he was on television receiving the interview, and the first words out of his mouth from the interviewer were, you know, all glory be to God for what God is doing and, and, and what he's accomplished, and it's not about us, it's about him. And you hear Christians sometimes say things like that, and, and sometimes we blow past it, sometimes we don't. Sometimes we think it's an impressive statement, sometimes it's like, well, that's just what all athletes say. But it is easier said than done. I remember as a uh, a high school player, my, probably my most famous moment in high school basketball, and I was not more of a baseball player than a basketball player, but in the district championship game, my 11th grade year, uh, our team was in the finals, and I ended up, I was a, a starter on that team, and I think I only scored 11 or 13 points or something like that in the game, but nine of those points occurred in the last five minutes of the fourth quarter where I went nine for nine from the free throw line, and we only ended up winning the game by a couple of points. But those free throw shots were vitally important, not only for preserving the win, but also accomplishing it. And the local paper actually set up an interview with me the next day to interview me about my success and the championship and everything else. This is the only time I've ever been interviewed for anything, okay? And so I go through the interview questions and do all of this, and uh, the, the write-up, in the, it's in the county paper, it's not that big of a deal, right? But, you know, I had the headline and everything else in the sports section, and, and uh, my coach afterwards asked me, he said, did you give glory to God in the interview? And I was like, I hadn't. I, I didn't say anything about that. Now, the interview never went that way. I simply answered the questions, but I absolutely failed as, and it, was, it just hit me and struck me. So every time somebody does say that in a game, hey, they might be saying it, they did way better than I did in the moment. That's the reality of the situation. Because we so easily gravitu gravitate toward fame, and we sometimes neglect what our life should really be about, and that is faith in God who ultimately gives the victory. And our story today is about that. It's about Saul, and it's about Jonathan. And over the past weeks, we've seen things begin very well for Saul. They've gotten off to a good start. Through him, the Lord was able to accomplish a great victory. And the nation recognized it, and they're establishing Saul as king. And as we looked in chapter 12 last week, Samuel, in this time of transition, had some uh, reality check for the nation of Israel, for their new king, 
And he challenged the people that for their need to trust, fear, and serve the Lord above all else. The question that now faced Saul, and as we'll see unfold in these next chapters, is will Saul effectively lead the people to fear, serve, and trust the Lord? Will he lead them in faith above all else? We will see today that Saul is much more about himself, kind of backseats God and his word. Notice how chapter 13 opens. If, if, if you look ahead into the rest of the stories of Samuel and the kings, especially when a king comes on the scene, his reign begins with a verse like verse 1. Saul was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned over Israel 42 years. What's so fascinating about this verse is if you, you kind of see those little letters sometimes that pop up next to words, and they have notes at the bottom. Well, if you have the NIV, you can see those notes. The Hebrew text actually does, is missing the numbers here. It says, uh, and Saul began to reign when he was, and it does, it, it's missing the numbers. We have no idea how old he was from the Hebrew text. I have to actually plug in the New Testament in here to get some of these answers. And he reigned over Israel, and the Hebrew text doesn't have 42 years. It actually has just two years. And it's, it's not a mistake, it's something that's fallen out of the text, but it's, it's almost like the Holy Spirit wanted to preserve for us. As good as it looks for Saul, his reign is one that's going to be very impermanent. It's not going to last. It's going to fail. And as the story unfolds, it's going to be a very short-lived reign for Saul, especially in his faith in God and his following of God, specifically his word. In these two chapters, chapters 13 and 14, there's a depiction of Jonathan and Saul, and they teach us three truths about faith that I want to hone in on this morning. The first is this, that faith follows God's word above all else. Faith, our faith, should follow God's word above all else. The opening scene of this chapter re-engages Israel's nemesis, the Philistines, Verse 2, Saul chose 3,000 men from Israel. 2,000 were with him at Michmash and in the hill country of Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan at Gibeah in Benjamin. The rest of the men he sent back to their homes. So he got a force, but it's not a big force, a conscripted force. They're starting to pull people in to be his army. And Jonathan attacked the Philistine outpost at Geba, and the Philistines heard about it. Saul had the trumpet blown throughout the land and said, let the Hebrews hear, so all Israel heard the news. Saul has attacked the Philistine outpost, and now Israel has become obnoxious to the Philistines. And the people were summoned to join Saul. So a call goes out to the nation to come to engage this battle again. But there's a problem. The Philistines also assemble, verse 5. And as they assemble to fight Israel... 3,000 chariots show up and 6,000 charioteers and soldiers as numerous as the sand of the seashore. This is a lot more than 3,000. This is 3,000 chariots. This is like men in that day going against tanks, okay? It's, it's a much stronger force as the thousands gather, gather on the Philistine side. It's a, it's a reminder much to Israel, much like of what has happened in the past, whether it was the Egyptians or with the Midianites, Israel is completely outnumbered. And sensing the humanly insurmountable odds, what do the soldiers of Israel do? When the Israelites saw, verse 6, that their situation was critical and that their army was hard-pressed, they hid in caves and thickets among the rocks and in pits and in cisterns, cisterns. And some Hebrews even crossed the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Israel's soldiers left no rock unturned or hole empty in their finding a place to hide is kind of the idea of the text. Anywhere they could flee, they did. And yet Saul remains in place. Saul remains at Gilgal and all the troops with him were quaking with fear. Saul senses he's supposed to stay and he does. And he waited seven days, the time set by Samuel. And you've got to go back all the way to chapter 10 to kind of find this direction. But Samuel had given Saul word, orders, direction. You need to wait there seven days. And Saul did that. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal. 
And Saul's men began to scatter. And so the situation goes from insurmountable odds to even more grave danger as the Philistines are pressing in, his men are fleeing, even his own army that he's conscripted is deserting, and so what is Saul to do? So Saul said, bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offering. He's he's preparing now to go into battle. He's ready to Fight this. And just as he finished making these offerings for battle preparation, Samuel arrived and Saul went out to greet him. What have you done? asked Samuel. And Saul replied, Well, when I saw that the men were scattering and that you did not come at the set time and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought, Now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal and I have not sought the Lord's favor. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. Now, in Samuel's direction back in chapter 10, Samuel commanded specifically Saul, I will come, you wait for me, and I will offer the burnt offerings. And that's not what Saul does. He feels compelled to offer them, to gain the Lord's favor, to go into this battle. And Samuel's conclusion is this, you have done a foolish thing. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time, but now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of the people because you have not kept the Lord's command. Then Samuel left Gilgal, went up to Gibeah and Benjamin. Saul counted the men who were with him, and they numbered about 600. Samuel gives the Lord's judgment of this situation this whole scenario essentially was a test by god to see if saul's faith would remain in obedience to his word and saul stepped out above the word of the lord the lord says he will now remove saul's descendants from the throne and establish one after his own heart one loyal to him marked by listening and heeding and submitting his life to the lord's word and as a result samuel leaves in the direction and the voice of god leaves saul so what do we make of this story this scene i mean really saul how how can you really blame him right like he's He's being pressed in. The circumstances have turned, and it's, it's an ugly situation. In fact, it looks, from all human viewpoints, like it's going to be a bloodbath if he doesn't do something and step up. Was it really wrong for him to offer a sacrifice? That's the other question. I, I don't think the sin was in the sacrifice. Some, some think it was, but David and Solomon themselves both offer sacrifices, and that's not a bad thing. So I don't know that what Saul was doing in the sacrifice itself was necessarily wrong. And technically, he waited until the appointed time. Samuel said seven days, and as the narrator says, the seven days came to a conclusion, and no Samuel. So what should Saul have done here? He should have done something, right? Well, yes and no. And there's where Saul messed up. What he needed to do was to obey the command given by the prophet, Samuel, who represented the voice of God to Saul. This was God's word. This was God's direction to him. And Saul, even amidst the circumstances, decided to get out in front of God's word, God's command, disobey that in his refusal to wait for Samuel, and he failed the test demonstrating a lack of trust in the word of God. Our faith needs to be in God's word above all else. We aren't to set that word aside or choose our own way over the clear direction of God's word. Any parent has had this discussion with a child, maybe not around God's word, but think about the position of authority of the parent. What their word is should be law to the child, right? And you always, every one of us as a child or as a parent have had this discussion at some point in this relationship of, 
I told you to do this, but, you know, Dad, you didn't understand everything that was going on and all of this and that. And we come up with the excuses as to why we chose not to obey the word of God. And sometimes we'll even blame the parent. You, you failed to do this. It doesn't matter, right? That's the famous words of the dad to the child. This is what I told you to do. And you failed. You disobeyed. And essentially, that's what Saul has done here. There is no excuse. He failed to heed the word given by God. And the teaching to us is when God's word gives us direct command, direct instruction, we are to obey that word. We are to submit our lives to God's word. This past week we were in our, I'll give you an example. This past week we were in our uh, men's study on Thursday morning and we were in Ephesians 5 and Ephesians 6. And there's a lot of commands in Ephesians 5 and 6, but specifically to men, especially many of us who are married men, there's that stretch, right, in 22 down through 33 there. We'll skip the first part of that about wives and submission and all of that, but husbands are to do what? Come on, men, you should know this. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Direct command. But in that marriage relationship, we can come up with all sorts of reasons and rationales why we shouldn't have to do that. You, you don't understand how I'm being treated. You don't understand what I'm missing out. You don't understand how she's not doing what she's supposed to do. And, and we rationalize disobedience to love her like Christ loved the church. I mean, Christ loved the church. That's a pretty high standard, right? Yeah, you're supposed to pursue that. And the rationales fail when we have a direct command by God. It doesn't matter. Our obedience to that is to love her. To go after her and demonstrate that love toward her. Despite the way it's coming the other way. In no way does her action in that negate God's command to us. And the reverse works, too, for the, the wife as, as far as respect and reverence and submission. To not get out in front of the husband, even if there is a lack of leadership there. It, it does not matter in the scripture. Christ is honored when we submit ourselves to the word of God and the command of God to us. If we intentionally set aside the word of God in areas of our life... This is what I think the danger is, especially at the end of this. Notice, Samuel gets up and leaves. He goes away. And he's going to be gone for the next chapters here. If we intentionally set aside the word of God in areas of our life, we can anticipate that the direction of God over our lives will be hampered in all areas of our life. And that's the great danger of setting aside and choosing not to follow God's word above all else. You see this sometimes. You, there's a, a person in there, uh, some, usually it's an acquaintance or it might be a family member or something like that, a, a person who you know is just absolutely living in sin. And yet sometimes you'll hear out of their mouth, well, God is doing this, or I prayed and got this, and you're like, wait a second. That might have been the circumstances working that way, but the obvious sinful pattern of your life, you're not in the will of God. And we can self-deceive and we can convince ourselves. But if we are living in known disobedience to the clear teaching of God's word, we're sinning in that area of our life. Not that there's not slip-ups at times, but I'm talking about actually engaging in life pattern dominating sin. We are going to hinder the work of God, the word of God, the effect of God's leading in the rest of our lives. That's what Saul experienced. Because... He did not demonstrate the trust and the faith to follow God's word above all else. If I regard iniquity in my heart, what's the rest of that verse? The Lord will what? Not hear me. Sin separates. It separates us from God. It separates us from his will. It hinders the effect of his word if we choose sin, self, whatever over obedience to the simple truth of God's word. But there's a second aspect of faith that we need to see here. Not only does faith 
follow God's word above all else. Faith acts trusting God to save as he sees fit. The rest of chapter 3 or three, the rest of chapter 13 elaborates the de- desperate situation of Israel. Notice, Saul and his son Jonathan, verse 16, and the men with them were staying in Gibeah and Benjamin while the Philistines camped at Michmash. Raiding parties went out from the Philistine camp. One turned toward Ophrah in the vicinity of Shul. Another turned toward Beth Horon. And the third toward, toward, turned toward the borderland overlooking the valley of Zeboim facing the wilderness. Now a blacksmith could not be found in the whole land of Israel because the Philistines had said otherwise the Hebrews will make swords or spears. So all Israel had to go down to the Philistines to have their plow points, their mattocks, their axes, sickles sharpened. That's their farming equipment. And the price was two-thirds of a shekel and all of this detail about this. So on the day of battle, not a soldier with Saul and Jonathan had a sword or spear in his hand and only Saul and Jonathan, his son, had them. Why this detail? It's showing the desperate situation Israel was in. They didn't even have swords. If they wanted their farm utensils sharpened, they had to go to the Philistines. The only two men in the entire army who have a sword are Saul and his son Jonathan. How are they going to defeat a Philistine army made up of 3,000 chariots and soldiers as numerous as the sand of the sea? This was surely a desperate situation for Israel. One would expect that if anything were to happen to bring about the deliverance of the people, it would need to come through either Jonathan or Saul, but not just through them. It would have to be the Lord working through one of them to accomplish this. Is it going to be Saul or is it going to be Jonathan? Well, that's where chapter 14 opens. There was a detachment of Philistines that were at Michmash. And one day, Jonathan, son of Saul, said to his young armor bearer, Come, let's go over to the Philistine outpost on the other side. But he didn't tell his father. Keep that in the back of your mind. That'll come up later in the story. Saul doesn't know where Jonathan is at. And Saul was staying in the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree in Migron. And with him were 600 men. So Jonathan is going to go out toward the Philistines and confront them while Saul stays seated in, under a tree. Among him was Ahijah who was wearing an ephod. The ephod would be the thing to give direction from the Lord, but it's not Samuel has it, it's Ahijah. Who is this guy? Well, he was a son of Ichabod's brother, Ahitub, son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh. Do you think God's going to speak through that guy? That's the question, right? If you think of that genealogy, this is the Eli house. God's already condemned them. Not really the guy you're going to anticipate good things coming from. But that's all Saul had because Samuel had left. No one was aware where Jonathan had gone. And on each side of the pass that Jonathan intended to cross, so there's a a pass going through like a ravine through these high uh, outcroppings of rocks and cliffs, On one side was Bozes and the other Senna, these hard places. One cliff stood to the north, the other to the south. And Jonathan said to his young armor bearer, Come, let's go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised men, the Philistines, and perhaps the Lord will act in our behalf. And nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. From the perspective of Jonathan, this was a a pretty... uh, Difficult situation. You're going to have to walk up a pass, basically up a cliff, climb to where the Philistine outpost is on the high ground. And if you know anything about warfare, you don't attack typically going uphill. That's not a good position to attack from, especially when you're outnumbered one to the army, right? Like the army is up there and you are one. But that's what Jonathan is contemplating doing here. How can he come to a conclusion that maybe this might be successful? Well, it's not about him. The key is found toward the end of verse 6. The Lord, perhaps, will act on our behalf. Why? Because nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. Jonathan remembered the story of Gideon, right? Where 300 could defeat the soldiers as numerous as the sands on the seashore. And so he trusts in that ability of God. He didn't care about numbers. And he didn't even know for a guarantee that God was going to do this. Perhaps the Lord will act this way. What his faith is, is in God and God's ability to deliver. And God might not even choose to deliver, but it didn't matter. He was going to step out in faith. Just like men who would come after in Israel's history, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. God can surely do this. Perhaps he won't, but we're still going to trust him. 
Once the Philistines give a sign, Jonathan will know what to do. Do all that you have in mind, as armor bearer said. Verse 8, Jonathan said, well, come on then. We will cross over. If they say to us, wait there until we come to you, we will stay where we are. But if they say, come on up to us, we'll climb up. Because that will be our sign that the Lord has given them into our hands. And so both of them showed themselves to the Philistine outpost. Post, Look, said the Philistines, the Hebrews are crawling out of their holes where they were hiding. And the men shouted to Jonathan and his armor bearer, come up to us and we'll teach you a lesson. There's the key words that Jonathan heard, come up. And at that, he told his armor bearer, climb up after me. The Lord has given them into our hands, the hands of Israel. And Jonathan climbed up with his armor bearer behind him. Can you imagine? This is, like, this is like princess bride stuff here, right? You know, like with Andre the Giant and the guy looking down the cliff of despair and here comes this idiot climbing up the cliffs. And yet that's exactly the situation as the Philistines watch this guy come up. How is this guy going to beat a whole garrison of Philistines? And Jonathan climbed up and he engaged And his armor bearer followed and killed behind him. And in that first attack, Jonathan and his armor bearer killed some 20 men in an area of about a half an acre. It wasn't Jonathan. It wasn't him in this. This is completely against all odds. This is the Lord giving them into his hand. And as the Philistines see this, verse 15, panic struck the whole army. Those in the camp, in the field, in the outposts, And the ground shook, and it was a panic sent by God. God shows up. Israel's true warrior, Yahweh, comes into the Philistine camp so that an earthquake takes place, and it sends the people into a panic. Saul's lookouts see this as the armies of the Philistines are melting away from their camps. And Saul said, muster the men. See who has left. And when they did, it was Jonathan and his armor bearer who were not there. And Saul said to Ahijah, bring the ark of God. While Saul was talking to the priest, the tumult in the Philistine camp increased more and more. So Saul said to the priest, withdraw your hand. What's going on here? Well, Jonathan is a one-man army basically bringing down the Philistines. And, and Saul gets word of it. And, and, and rather than seeing this is obviously the work of God saving the people of Israel, Saul's like, well, let's, let's, let's get the ark over here, which is six miles away, by the way. Let's bring that thing over, and let's try to figure out what we're supposed to do next. Uh, God is saving you. Maybe go get in the battle is what Saul should be concluding, right? And yet his conclusion is, i got to wait to see what God wants to do. And as, as the, it becomes more obvious, finally he tells this guy, all right, let's, let's just go. And Saul and all his men assembled and went to the battle, and they found the Philistines in total confusion, striking each other. The 600 Hebrews don't even have to fight. The Philistines are killing each other. And those Hebrews who had previously been with the Philistines and had gone out, now even they rally and come back. And all the Israelites who had hidden in the hill country of Ephraim heard that the Philistines were on the run, so they join in, and they're all motivated now to fight. And on that day, the Lord saved Israel. And the battle moved on beyond Beth Haven. Saul and his men are rallied out of the act of faith by Jonathan. And on that day, the Lord saved his people. The contrast between Jonathan and Saul in this scene could not be clearer. Jonathan surveyed the situation and chose to act in faith based on the strength and the ability of the Lord, Yahweh, to save his people. What did Saul do? Saul remained idle. Saul was under the tree. Saul was sitting there. Saul delayed. Saul sought further direction from God in the face of God's obvious work to save. Now, I don't think we draw from a a conclusion from this that we should emulate Jonathan's asking for a sign. God, give me a sign, and when I get the sign, then I will go. That can prove dangerous. But the application here isn't requiring God's will to be discerned. Why? Because Jonathan is acting in faith in God when God clearly reveals his will through the sign. Here's the thing. We don't need signs because God has clearly already revealed his will for us in his word. Here's what you are to do. This is the task I set before you. So God's will is clearly revealed to us. 
God has demonstrated his ability to save. That then requires us, like Jonathan, to engage the battle in faith. Not in our ability, but in God's ability to save. We have the will of God clearly revealed to us. The question is, will we obey it? Will we act on it? Will we trust God to save? And so many of us come up with every excuse known to man not to engage in God's great plan of salvation that is at work through his great commission today. That's, here's the command to you. This is everyone's will by God. Make disciples, right? It's clearly revealed in his word. Here is the task for the church. Disciple. And we come up with every excuse known to man why not to engage that thing. And yet 2,000 years of church history has clearly demonstrated God's ability to use that simple command and his word as the mechanism through which we disciple to transform lives and save lives and take a group of a small and spread it all across the world. So why would we think that plan's going to fail? We might get rejected, but we're not going to fail. We can't because God is mighty to save And he's given us his clearly revealed word to engage it. Do we believe that God is mighty to save? Do we believe God is powerful to save? And are we willing to step out and act on it so that God can prove through the faith of his children that he will do what he says? That was Jonathan. When the will of God became apparent, he stepped into it in faith. He didn't delay. He didn't make excuse. He didn't come up with reasons why he shouldn't or how he was unqualified to. We don't demand that God must act in a certain way when his will is clearly not revealed. But we do when it is. But here's the the amazing thing about us. When God's will is clearly revealed in his word, we come up with excuses not to obey it. When we don't know what God's will is and God doesn't answer the way we want him to answer, then we question God, right? And his goodness and his ability and his power. We tend to demand that God's will be such and such in personal matters of our own lives. And why would God do this? Well, God's will isn't clearly revealed about what our future individually might be. We, we, we don't know. We still act in faith by submitting ourselves to his clearly revealed word. And then, as we will see here in a moment, we take whatever God's will is for our lives for us and submit to it. Faith acts trusting God to save as God sees fit. But there's one more lesson about faith in the rest of chapter 14. And it's this, that faith focuses on God's saving work rather than our personal attention and achievement. This same day, verse 24 picks up and gives the perspective, not from Jonathan's victory and the Lord's salvation through him, but from Saul. Now the Israelites in this same day were in distress that day. Why? Why were the Israelites in distress? God is winning this battle. Because Saul had bound the people under an oath saying, Cursed be anyone who eats food before evening comes, before I have avenged myself on my enemies. So no troops tasted food. Saul here has this amazing knack to almost, in the victory of the Lord, almost snatch defeat from the jaws of victory here. God's about to win, and Saul almost is able to pull that win away. He placed the army under an oath. Why? To motivate them to stay in the battle so that he could personally be avenged. This is about him now. And as a result, the army remained famished and without energy to engage the enemy to finish it off. And we see as the story goes on, they enter a woods, there was honey on the ground. Remember, Saul was, or Jonathan was not with Saul, so he did not know what Saul's oath was. And they saw this honey using out, but no one touched it. Yet Jonathan, who hadn't heard of what his father had bound the people to under his own rash oath, reached out 
took some and was energized. His eyes were brightened at the end of verse 27. Verse 28, then one of the soldiers told him, your father bound the army under a strict oath. Cursed be anyone who eats this. That's why all the men are faint. And Jonathan said, my father has made trouble for the country. That's a very interesting Hebrew word. It's the same word that's used of Achan's sin and the trouble it brought upon the the nation of Israel when he chose to hide the Jericho plunder. It's the same word that Jephthah uses when his daughter emerges from a house. Trouble has come upon me. How much better it would have been if the men had eaten today, Jonathan says, because then we could have truly destroyed and slaughtered the Philistines. We could have wiped them out. And that day, the text goes on to say the Israelites had struck down the Philistines from Michmash to Aijalon, and they were exhausted. The gap between Michmash and Aijalon is 20 miles over incredibly rough mountainous terrain. In one day, covering that amount of distance, in, engaged in warfare, you would be absolutely famished and spent And if Saul wouldn't have been so self-centered in this, demanding this oath for his own glory, God would have been able to work through them to wipe out the Philistines. But instead, the people were exhausted, and so when they entered into a woods at the end of this day and see sheep and cattle and calves, they butcher them right there and just eat them with the blood in them, something that breaks God's law. And so someone says to Saul, look, the men are sinning against the Lord by eating this. And so Saul has... We've got to set up an altar. We've got to slaughter animals. We've got to confess the sin. That's kind of what goes on in 34 and 35. And then Saul's like, well, let's finish it off now. Verse 36, let's go down and pursue them this night. The priest says, well, let's inquire of the Lord first. In 37, Saul asks God, shall I go down and pursue? Will you give them into my hands? But God did not answer him that day. Samuel's not there. God's not going to speak through this other guy. That house is already done. And so Saul has no access to the word of God. Saul concludes there must be sin in the camp. And so he calls the leadership together. And they do a whole lot casting ceremony. And it's discovered that who's guilty but Jonathan, his own son. And what curse had Saul placed him under? He would surely now have to, what? Die. Because he had broken Saul's oath. Tell me what you have done, verse 43, when Jonathan is discovered. I tasted a little honey with the end of my staff And now I must die, Jonathan says. Saul said, may God deal with me, be it ever so severely, if you do not die, Jonathan. Saul's going to kill his own son, the one who was the savior of Israel that day, right? God used him to deliver. But the men said to Saul, should Jonathan die? He who has brought about this great deliverance, never, as surely as the Lord lives, not a hair of his head will fall to the ground, for he did This today with God's help. And the men rescued Jonathan. He was not put to death. And Saul stopped pursuing the Philistines and they withdrew to their own land. Isn't that interesting? How that verse ends it. Victory was right there. Complete victory. The Philistines were to be wiped out on the battlefield that day. But Saul's own Fame, Saul's own ambition, Saul's own goals get out in front of God's victory. And the Philistines escape to plunder and haunt Israel for the the next generation. And what we see here is this action by Saul, a, a faith that's focused more on personal attention, his own achievement, stymieing the victory that God was to be accomplishing that day. Jonathan was saved, but Jonathan will basically have for the rest of a story sort of this guilt over his head, and he will die. And that's one of the great failings of this text is Jonathan. You you almost see here this, this man who would have been a great king for the nation of Israel, one who trusted God, and yet that would never materialize. So what do we make of this last scene? Saul looks religious here. Saul's offering sacrifices. Saul's seeking the Lord's guidance. There's a mask of religion and spirituality, but it's masking a desire for control, for notice, for fame on Saul's part. 
Saul is representing here leadership that is leading out of self-interest, not God. And God essentially unmasks him. How do we know when we are serving God out of our own interest rather than God's fame, God's glory? Let me give you an indicator. A sure sign of service for God done out of self-interest is when jealousy or envy occurs in us at the success, spiritual success of another. When God is clearly doing something through another person's life and ministry, and all that is producing in my life is envy and jealousy of that person, that's probably a pretty clear sign that there's something wrong in here. That I'm more about me being famous, me receiving attention, me receiving praise, me receiving glory than God receiving it. And the result of that can be action and even sometimes worship, like Saul does here, empty of God and empty of God's power. And actually sort of counteracting the very saving work that God wants to be accomplishing. But there's one more application that I think we can make out of this point that faith focuses on God's saving work rather than personal attention and achievement. And that's the example of Jonathan here. Jonathan serves as a model of one that remains faithful to God, trusts him to accomplish whatever God desires, despite what the outcome of that might be for my own life. So many abandon God because circumstances in their life don't go according to their plans. Why would God allow his children to suffer or even die before they live a full life for him? And we question God on why God allows that. Why would God not raise up Jonathan instead of Saul? Why would God cut this guy off, this faithful one off? Because of Saul. Why would God do that? We ask that question, let me try to illustrate it this way. We ask that question from a perspective that is incredibly limited. I, I'm not a big chess player. I, I know how to play chess. I know the rules of chess. I could play you in chess. If you are at all good in chess, you would probably beat me. I, I don't play it very often. But let me use an analogy from chess. Our perspective would be the pawn. We're, we're speaking from the position of the pawn. And then we look at life, and we look at the game of life, and we look at the perspective, and we see it from the perspective of the pawn. That's us. And we look at what God is doing, and we question, God, why would you make me do this, or why would you lead in this direction, or why would this be the outcome for my life? But who is God in the game of chess? I mean, God is, the he's from the perspective of not just a player of chess, but he's like the ultimate grand master of chess, right? Like this is the Garry Kasparov of chess. This is the greatest, who not only knows what the pawn should be doing, but he knows all of the moves, 50 moves ahead in the game of what's going to happen and how this is going to unfold and how what he does and what he accomplishes with the pawn is going to bring about his greater purposes. And so many times we think of life from the perspective of ourselves and how this must happen or this must happen or why did this happen and God, I'm done with you because you allowed this to happen and we're not seeing what God is doing in his overall plan and that we are simply pawns in that game. Important pieces, but in his great plan of winning and establishing his kingdom and setting up his plan of salvation, sometimes the pawns become what? Expendable. Sometimes you sacrifice them in order to get to other positions and accomplish other things. You know, God has set up a world in which he gives us real choice in this matter, right? He gives us opportunity to act, and he's not just factoring our life into that game. He's factoring the lives of billions of people into that game all at the same time with all of the choices they are making and all of that is being directed and set up by God to accomplish in the end his great victory. And however the Grand Master gets to victory, and however he chooses to use the pieces and expend of the pieces at times, the win is in the end, right? And if God expends some of us in that process for his glory to get the win, that's awesome. 
Because that's God's work. And we get to contribute to that through his saving work, through his accomplishment. You see, God may have reasons within his overall plan of salvation to allow a life to be cut short, to allow a life not to reach its ultimate, what we think would be best conclusion. We don't know what the descendants of Jonathan would have been like, but God knew what the descendants of David would be like, and he knew what his son would be like coming from that line. And that's the overall game plan here. But here's the beauty of Jonathan's faith. Jonathan simply trusted, and he acted on faith and allowed himself to be used however God wanted to do that. God calls us to trust our lives to him, to live by faith in his revealed word, and to submit our wills and our actions to him, whatever the outcome or course that he sets for our lives. Because in the end, he wins. And in the end, if we trust him, we are there on that day hearing, well done, good and faithful servant. You see, the point of all of this in this contrast of Saul with, Saul, uh, with Jonathan is this. Faith looks to God rather than focuses on circumstances or self. Saul, in circumstances, chose to disobey the clearly revealed word of God. Saul, when it came to the battle and the victory of the Lord, was more preoccupied with himself being avenged rather than God's victory being accomplished. But true faith looks to God, his glory, his saving work, his plan, and focuses on that rather than our circumstances or self. Circumstances are going to tempt us at times, folks, to turn from God. Circumstances are going to tempt us at times to doubt God's love to doubt God's care. Circumstances are used by God to test our faith, to see where it truly lies. But circumstances, especially when our faith remains in God, can become amazing vehicles for God to use as testimonies of his grace, of testimonies of his salvation. As his Faithful people believe, trust, and submit their lives to him no matter what the circumstances say. The question for us is this. Are we in this relationship of faith for God's glory? Or are we in this for self? Jonathan is a reminder that our own future may not work out well for us, but our lives are not our own anyways. They have been bought with a price, the precious blood of Christ that we are celebrating this week. And therefore, we are to glorify God with our bodies, however he chooses to use them. Is that how your faith is characterized? That it looks to God and his saving work despite what the circumstances, despite what it might mean for self. But it's for his glory. Lord, as we close this morning, This passage serves as a, I think, a solemn reminder of how easily we can look very religious, we can look very obedient on the outside at times, but our hearts are focused on the circumstances around us, our hearts are focused on ourself and our own ambition. And you're reminding us here, God, through the examples of Saul Saul and, and Jonathan, that you can use us however you see fit. And what you require of us is to submit our lives to you, to your word. To devote our hearts to you. To step out in faith, trusting you to bring the victory. To set our own selfish ambition, glory aside. Lord, I, I, we are so glad that you do, don't just ask of this and then just expend of us. But Lord, you have an overall plan that is working to your salvation, to an establishment of your kingdom, and you use us in that. And so God, I pray over this church that every one of us, individual believers in Jesus Christ, that every one of us would be used by you to accomplish your glory, your fame, your saving work in this community and around the world, no matter how you choose to use that. God, I think every one of us would pray that for ourselves, for our kids, for our grandchildren, 
But Lord, make that real in our life. Make it, make it the reality and the conviction of our heart to submit when the circumstances don't look right. When it, it doesn't fit with our vision of what we should, our future should look like. But Lord, may it produce in us a confidence by the power of your spirit to step in faith into obedience to your word, to call on your life, the mission that you have, so that you can prove yourself powerful and great and accomplish your work of salvation through those who are faithful stewards. For your glory, we pray all of this in the powerful, saving, resurrected name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.